Welcome back to the second session on the common law history. We reach now Act 2 that I call Common Law and Equity. On the title slide, you see Edward Cook, uh, who has been a Tony General, who has been a great, a great promoter of the common law in uh, the late 16th and early 17th century. And he represents the common law. And you have Thomas More, who has been a chancellor and was active in the 16th century. And we will see how the two systems have developed and managed to coexist over time. Based on what we discussed in the previous video, you understood that the common law grew towards some rigidity. It was based on specialized forms of action. And if your case did not fit the scope of the action as defined in the writ, you could, litigants could be in trouble and have a hard time to bring their case to the royal court. Um, there was a risk, therefore, of denial of justice. There was indeed a chance that you would not be able to access the royal court. So what to do if no writ was corresponding to the case? This is a situation that we have visited in uh, the civil law, right? Gaps or lacuna in the law. But here it occurs in a different way. It is not substantive law that is silent, but it is a problem of how do I access the court? The problem is more of a procedural nature. So one answer to the problem was, of course, to create new writs. And originally, that was not much of a deal because writs were created at will by the chancellor. When the chancellor identified that there was a gap, that there was a problem, where why there was no avenue to the court, he, he just created a new writ. But every time the chancellor was creating a new writ, it was business, legal business, taken away from the lo uh, local courts, taken away from the manorial courts, and the lords were making money out of justice, and that generated some resistance. Um, in the 13th century, in 1258, some provisions were adopted. I mean, a piece of legislation known the provisions of Oxford, where the king happened to reside with his council at the time. And it was agreed in the provisions of Oxford that it would take the sanction of the king and his council uh, to create a new writ. Um, king's council and later on parliament. So new writs could only be created by way of parliament decision. And it took indeed a strong king, you see, to push towards the creation of new writs because it constantly met the resistance of the lords and of the local communities. Another possibility was to extend or stretch the scope of existing writs. And it has been agreed in the Statute of Westminster in 1285 that the Chancery may issue new writs if the facts were in consimili casu. What, that's a Latin word. What does it mean? Consimili casu means in a similar case, a case that is not identical, but resembles enough the typical situation that was described in the writ so that we could extend or stretch the scope of the writ. Of the writ. Um, and that generated the existence of what was called the actions on the case. This is a very, very strange terminology. Think of forms. Let me give you an example. Imagine that you want to file something, you know, for benefit, for social security or uh, 
Medicaid benefit. You typically need forms to do this. And imagine that you are in a sort of particular situation where you do not know whether you have to use uh, form 111 or form 112, and uh, you call the administration and they tell you, well, actually, there is no form corresponding to your case, but take 112 and use the box at the end to describe your situation, and hopefully, our administration will pay attention to it. That is the sort of thing that was done. And it was called action on the case because you used a writ and tried to stretch it or extend it to a particular case that was not particularly targeted by that writ. We have seen um, a phenomenon that resembles this in the civil law world, the use of analogy when you have a case that is not pro provided for, but you have a provision that seems to cover neighboring situations. Just the idea to make analogy and stretch a little bit, bring a little bit flexibility in the law. So that worked to some extent, and a, a famous example has been stretching the scope of the writ of trespass so that it would reach not only situation when parties had acted directly or forcibly, but also situation where you simply had negligence. And if the gap remained, if nothing worked, no new writ, no action on the case gets allowed, well, you know the answer. You have resort to equity. Equity, but this time in the English context, okay? In the civil law world, we have seen that ordinary judges can resort to equity when the law is silent, when the code does not provide for. In the common law world, the royal courts were not allowed to do equity. They had to perform within the words of the writ, and they could not go beyond except in these few cases where they were allowed to make analogies. So where to go? Actually, the big complaint is that these wire courts supposed to give justice in the king's name were actually refusing to take the case. So where should you call for in such a situation? Think a minute. The supreme power of justice resided in the king himself. The king was described in medieval time as a fountain of justice, the hand of justice, was one of the symbols of the royal power. So why not petition the king and try to get relief? So parties being frustrated, not finding a writ matching their case, were calling via a petition for the king's mercy. The king having much else to do would delegate such petitions to his chancellor. And the chancellor was actually the closest advisor to the king, advisor to the king in political affairs, in religious affairs, as the chancellor was an ecclesiastic, and even in matters of conscience, in matters related to the king's private life, because the chancellor was actually confessing the king. He was the keeper of the king's conscience. So the chancellor was asked to review these petitions and typically not being a lawyer would decide the case in conscience and in equity, applying a religious precept or religious uh, morality. So, and over time, the chancellor and his court, because over time a court of chancery was created, they developed a body of law and doctrine, a body of principles that was referred to under the name of equity. So you start having two bodies of law, the common law on one side administered by the royal court, in equity administered by the chancellor and his court. Initially, 
equity varied according to the chancellor's personality, depending on uh, the chancellor's personal sense of justice. You could have tough chancellors or chancellors who were soft hearted. It was said that uh, the equity of the chancellor varied with the length of his foot. But over time, especially after the creation of a court of chancery, equity became more predictable. And yet, a judge deciding a case in equity still, even to this day, has large discretionary powers. Here are a few maxims of equity that still make sense to this day in England, in the United States, in Canada, in Australia, New Zealand, and in all the common law jurisdictions. The first one says that equity acts in personam. That actually means that equity is enforced on the person of the defendant. If the defendant is proven to be wrong, the chancellor will deliver an injunction ordering the defendant to act in a rightful manner or prohibiting this party from acting in a wrongful manner. Equity acts on the conscience. Typically, the chancellor would call to the conscience of the defendant and looked into the conscience and the honesty of the litigants. The third maxim of equity that appears here says that equity follows the law, which is a little bit strange to uh, grasp. Equity follows the law means that decisions based on equity should not contradict or displace the common law. The role of equity is simply to fill the gaps, to cover those situations where no writ is existing. But equity should not contradict what the common law has decided by way of judicial precedent. The fourth maxim on the slide, equity looks at the intent, not at the form indicates that equity cares about subjectivity, about the intent, the good or bad intent of people. And they are not obsessed by formalism, you know, like in the system of the writs. Rather, speak to the conscience. Look at the intent. Then you have, he who seeks equity must do equity. If indeed the party calling for the equity of the chancellor does not act in a merciful or equitable manner, this party is not going to benefit from the protection of equity. You've got to act along the lines of the sort of justice that the chancellor is administering. And the last maxim that I have on the slide, he who comes to equity must come with clean hands. Oh, that's a very, they call it the COVID maxim. We've got to wash hands all the time. Well, it is to be understood this time in a figurative sense. A dishonest person, a person who has been guilty of fraud in the past or criminal behavior will never obtain equitable relief will never obtain the help of equity because the chancellor is going to point to this misbehavior. So you may, in a similar situation, obtain justice in a court of common law because the court of common law is just looking at the forms, at the requirement of the action and may or may not pay attention to the fraudulent attitude. But in equity, there is no way that a person acting in bad faith or fraudulently will obtain relief. So at the end of the day, with the development of in parallel of the common law derived from the writ and equity based on judgments in conscience 
and equity made by the chancery, you have two bodies of law, the common law administered by the royal courts and equity administered by the court of chancery. There has been rivalry uh, over time. I'm not going to discuss this. Uh, there has been a point uh, in the 16th and 17th century where the system was about to change and the common law could have been disappeared and taken uh, you know, away or submerged by the development of the court of chancery. But Edward Coke has been fiercely defending and promoting the common law and both systems survived and developed in parallel um, with the principle that equity must follow the law and with the rule that if you had a conflict between a decision made by based on the common law and a decision made on equity, equity should always prevail. Having two systems of court, however, was not without inconvenience because you sometimes have cases where you need a principal remedy that is based on the common law and an accessory remedy that would be based on equity. And you would have to start two cases in two different courts. This is the reason why in the 19th century, England decided to merge the courts of common law and equity. And that was done with the Supreme Court of Judicature Acts that were passed in the late 19th century. The United States did the same because we had uh, in a, a majority of states, courts of common law and a, court, and a chancery court. There are only two states at this day that still have a chancery court, Delaware and Mississippi. Uh, otherwise, any court in our state or in England can administer both the common law and equity. Indeed, common law and equity remain separate body of rules and doctrines even to this day. And in the next video, I will discuss a few examples to show you how in a given case, an attorney or a judge may have to deal with two different sets of rule and they don't play exactly the same way. Another example that we will see that there is no jury trial when the case is in equity. That stems from the US Constitution. So here I have a diagram that shows common law and equity in parallel. You see that the common law administers legal remedies. And actually when you use the adjective legal, it means anything that derives from the common law. It protects legal interest. A legal interest is an interest that is traditionally protected by common law courts. Common law acts in REM. Uh, it, the judgments are enforced on the possession on the property owned by the defendant found liable to pay damages. Either the defendant, the defendant pays the damages or otherwise you can get hold of uh, the defendant's property uh, to be paid. So judgments are enforced on things, on property. Uh, common law tends to be objective and predictable. You've got pretty precise rules and these rules have been made more and more precise precedent after precedent. It is case by case driven. It develops based on cases. Let us look at equity now. Well, Courts, when they apply equity, administer equitable remedies. Equitable is the adjective that describes the application of principles or rules of equity. And equity is protecting equitable interest. The moment 
the remedy to protect your right is deriving from equity, you describe the interest as an equitable interest as opposed to a legal interest uh, protected by the common law. We have seen that equity acts in personam. It goes by way of injunctions that are enforced on the person. People are ordered to do or not to do something. We have seen also through the maxims of equity that equity is more subjective and takes into account intent, good or bad faith, and that there is a lot of judicial discretion. The judge conditions may be met or satisfied, but if the judge believes that the plaintiff is a fraudulent person, they'll say, sorry, you would have a good case, but you didn't act according to equity you won't benefit from it. That's the judicial discretion. And just like the common law, it is case by case driven. And you also see precedents being developed in the field of equity. Let us look now at the situation in the United States. And I propose to visit the US Constitution which is making a number of allusion to the common law and to equity. You have here uh, three uh, sections of the constitution. The first one that appears is habeas corpus that has been developed in the context of the common law. The right when you are arrested or arbitrarily detained to have access to a judge within a short period of time that has always been regarded as essential in all common law jurisdiction, and that is protected by our constitution. Look now at Article 3, Section 2, Clause 1. The judicial power should extend to all cases in law and equity arising under this constitution, the laws of the United States. You see, you have an allusion to law. Law means common law in this context. Uh, look at Article 3, you have an allusion to the jury system that comes from England. The trial of all crimes shall be by jury. And let's look now at a couple of amendments to the Constitution. The Sixth Amendment says that in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury. So the right to jury trial is protected by the Sixth Amendment. And the Seventh Amendment says in suits at common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved. And you have then a reference to the rules of the common law. That is quite remarkable. You see, this applies to cases that are common law cases, it excludes equity. So if you are looking for an equitable remedy that will not go to jury trial. So if you practice the law in the United States nowadays, you better be familiar with the distinction between common law and equity to find out whether you should go to jury trial or not. That concludes this presentation. And in the next video, we will discuss, revisit, if you will, the distinction between common law and equity, but this time with concrete examples. Thank you and see you soon.